Hi guys and welcome to History Infection. This week I'm planning about talking about measles, but before I want to start, I want to say my condolences to Gareth Cole for Williams' family for all his tragic loss um, due to, at least in part, measles. If you're not aware, Gareth was a 25-year-old male who recently died due to an epidemic of measles in Wales and the rest of the UK. Currently they're unsure whether or not measles was the direct cause of his death or a contributing factor. However, as I'm going to explain later, this is very often the case with measles. We're currently in the midst of a measles outbreak in the UK, and I personally put this down to several people, and one in particular, a charlatan of a doctor by the name of Dr. Andrew Wakefield. I, in no short terms, hold him accountable for the tragedies we're seeing in the UK at the moment. The thousand plus people who have become infected with measles and at least one person who has died of it. I'd like to talk mainly about the molecular biology of the measles virus, which is what I find interesting, what this whole series is about, but unfortunately I don't think I can do it justice without addressing the issues of the MMR hoax and conspiracy theories. Measles is a disease that's caused by a virus. It's a highly contagious virus. If an infected person comes in contact with someone who's susceptible, they have around about a 90% chance of spreading their infection. One of the earliest accounts of measles comes from a Persian scholarship text where the author states and tries to distinguish measles and smallpox. The author was also the same person who gave us the term alcohol, whose name I am about to mispronounce, Muhammad ibn Zakari Razi. The measles virus was first isolated by Thomas Peebles and his supervisor in 1954. They were working during an outbreak at a local Boston school and actually managed to collect enough blood samples to identify the virus. A 13-year-old boy by the name of David Edmonston was actually the single individual who gave him enough of a viral load for Peebles and his supervisor to identify and purify out the virus. From this point onwards, people were able to begin to produce vaccines to the virus, and the first vaccine was tested in 1958 on 11 schoolboys. All 11 of the boys developed a high enough antibody count to be considered immune to the virus. However, 9 of the 11 boys also developed a rash. This meant for the vaccine to become widespread, it had to be further refined. Some notes on the actual infectious properties of the measles virus. It starts off by infecting the linings of your throat and down into your lungs. From there, it moves into your lymphatic system, which is essentially your body's plumbing, your immune system's plumbing around your body. It then spreads from your lymphatic system all over your body to all sorts of different tissues. During this time, it takes roughly four days, the person doesn't show any symptoms. It's only when the second wave of whole body infection, again, coming from the lymphatic system, takes place that the person begins to show any symptoms of measles, normally starting as a rash around the neck and behind the ears. What actually causes the symptoms of measles, and for that case, of most diseases? In most cases, it's actually your body's immune system's response to an invading pathogen. The increase in fever, the coughing, the wheezing, the headache, all these things tend to be caused by your body's own systems trying to combat invading pathogens. With the exception of symptoms that help spread a pathogen, such as diarrhea or in some cases coughing, a pathogen doesn't really want its host to experience any symptoms because that, one, alerts the host that something's wrong and its immune system is alerted, and two, alerts other individuals in complex social groups like ourselves that that person is infected, and three, actually damages the host at the cost of what the bacterial virus could gain out of the resources. By damaging it, you're not necessarily getting the best ban for your buck if you're a virus or a pathogen. That actually might be a case for not taking some medication when you're a bit sick, like when you have the cold or a very mild flu. Taking aspirin and ibuprofen might make you feel better, but it might actually prolong the time you're actually infected as it modulates how your immune system is able to cope with the pathogen. I find this a really interesting topic, and hopefully I'll get another chance to come back to it and discuss it in greater detail. Measles also has another property that most people don't know about. It's actually an immune-suppressing disease. People who were in remission for TB or, say, syphilis, when they contracted measles, actually found that their old disease began to flare up again and began to cause a lot more problems than it used to when it was in remission. This is partly due to the fact that the measles virus actually attacks part of your immune system. It lives in your lymphatic tissue, which, is, as I said, is your body's immune system's plumbing. In the case of Gareth Colfer Williams, the immune suppressing nature of the measles virus means it's difficult to actually pinpoint 
if it was the measles virus that killed him or some secondary cause, but that was only due to the fact that his immune system was suppressed by the measles virus. This property of the virus was actually used to treat an autoimmune disease called lupus, which you've probably heard from from House. Lupus tends to affect the kidneys quite badly, actually damaging to the point where they are effectively destroyed and the person either needs a kidney transplant or will die. The measles virus attacked the immune system cells that were attacking the person, allowing them to have their kidneys recover as they were no longer being damaged by their own immune system response. Now let's talk about the MMR hoax. It was a scandal made up by several spin doctors, one corrupt and morally bankrupt doctor, and several other doctors to be fair, and a group of lawyers trying to sue a pharmaceutical company because they believed they were wrong somehow and couldn't actually come up with any evidence that the pharmaceutical company had done something wrong to them. Their second reason for constructing this entire hoax was actually, in my opinion, far worse. They wanted to instill a sense of mistrust in the triple dose vaccine, the MMR vaccine, because they held the patent to a single dose vaccine. Dr. Andrew Wakefield has a list of charges that any moral person would consider repulsive. First and worst on my list, he subjected children with learning difficulties to unnecessary and highly invasive medical procedures without the approval of any sort of ethical board or research committee. From these immoral practices, he hoped to gain a financial reward. As I mentioned earlier, him and the consortium lawyers are involved in owning a patent to a single dose vaccination. He wanted to make money out of promoting fear for a product, even though he knew this would at the very least lead to some people becoming very sick, and in some cases, as we've seen, some people would die. Not just content with those two things, he also falsified his data. If you go back and actually read the Lancet paper, it doesn't support the conclusion. But when they performed the medical review board on his practices, they looked at the original research logs, and even those don't match up with what he published. Others better than I have actually reviewed his paper ab nauseum, and if you want to go look at those, I suggest you do. Ben Goldacre is a first great stop to go look at. But I can say happily that there is not a single shred of scientifically valid research in there or morally supported work to be found in that paper. Without trying to sound too fundamental, I think it's actually a dangerous and vile publication that should see its proponents stripped of any sort of responsibility. Because it's that morally reprehensive that it just is sickening to think that we live in a world where people would do this to others just to make money and then try and blame them that they're the ones who are crusading for the greater good. Now, some of you might be thinking with the whole MMR scandal that surely it's the person's responsibility and the parent's responsibility to get their children vaccinated. Well, I would say, you know, yes, it is, but there is massive considerations to be made about this topic. First, if you are an uninformed person, which is perfectly fine, to be honest, not everyone has spent four years going through undergrad and graduate school to understand virology and genetics and statistics. Most people don't get this, and that's fine, that's understandable, it isn't easy. And they tend to get their information from media outlets, which unfortunately don't really care about what is true and what's not. They more care more about making a good story, something that will sell a piece of paper at the end of the day. I actually have quite a lot of sympathy for parents who are afraid to get their children vaccinated because you see it on the news that there's people effectively whispering boo in the parents' ears every time some medical complaint happens. And if I had a child, I would want to do everything I possibly could to make sure that child was safe and secure. And if someone is whispering in my ear horrible things about vaccinations, how I'm a bad parent or I'm an evil person supporting some pharmaceutical regime because I decided to get my child vaccinated, you can't help but second guess yourself. And in the best cases where the media actually tries to present a balanced view, they get someone who's probably quite well respected on one side, knows what they're talking about, should be respected, and some quack on the premise of balance, when in actual fact, the scientific consensus has nothing, nothing to do with what the quack has to say. But because they have to show both sides an argument, as if scientific research and the truth in the universe was de somehow debatable. We can sum up with this question, are vaccines safe? The honest answer is yes and no. Any medical research or condition or procedure or test carries some risk. Every time you take an aspirin, you're 
taking a little bit of risk that that aspirin will work as it does for you, as it does for everyone else. But the risks of vaccination are greatly outweighed by the risks of not getting vaccinated. And there is no risk, zero risk, from getting autism from having the MMR vaccination. It just doesn't exist. It hasn't been shown ever. Every bit of work looking to try and find this link has come up and said no, apart from people who have a conflict of interest, who want to try and prove it so they can make money from you. There's also one other point I want to raise, and that's that suggesting somehow that someone's mental learning difficulties are due to bad parenting is a disgusting thought in my opinion. Somehow blaming the parents for their child's autism or saying if you were a better person, if you were a better parent, your child wouldn't be suffering. If you would listen to the wishy-washy bullshit crap on this side, then your child would have grown up healthy. Bollocks to that, I say. Absolute bollocks. Measles was on its way out in the developed world until the advent of the MMR scandal. And this isn't the first vaccination scandal, but it's probably the best well-known and has the largest ramifications. Recently, a British newspaper decided to air the opinions of this Dr. Andrew Wakefield, where he tried to blame the government for continuing to try and issue a triple-dose vaccination, which for some reason he decided would have caused a greater amount of measles. Absolute bollocks. There's a clear case to be shown a decrease in vaccination has led to an increase in measles outbreak. And he is one of the main reasons that there's a decrease in the measles vaccination rate. The results ascribed to his research have been thoroughly disproven by correctly and precisely conducted scientific research. Vaccinations are a fantastic invention, and people have forgotten what it's like to live in a world when we didn't have vaccinations. A world where the whim of nature was to rip families apart, where some tiny invading pathogen could kill off whole families and whole groups of children, entire playgrounds silenced because some horrible little virus and some horrible little bacteria took over. That, but not that alone, is what a world of vaccinations has given us where families are no longer torn to shreds by some horrible little pathogen. So that brings me to an end of a history of infection of measles. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed it. I've, hoped, I've tried not to be too angry and fundamental in this video about the topic, but I feel very strongly about vaccinations and just how wonderful they are. I'll be back soon with some more history of infection, but in the meantime, I also want to start working on another series of videos, which I need your help for. So it's going to be called What Is where I'll try and answer a simple biological question quickly and as honestly as I can, I suppose. So, for example, what is an antibiotic, or what is chemotherapy, or what is an antibody? So if any questions like that, leave them below in the comments, and I will start making videos around those topics. But if you have any other questions or comments about this video, or measles topics, uh, or virus topics, or anything, leave them below and I'll try to get back to you. I hope you will join me next time when I'll be talking about a short history of typhoid. Thanks for watching. See you next time.